morning. Good morning and welcome to this last formal board meeting of 2017. It is uh, Tuesday, December 19th at 9.32 a.m. I'm Felicia Marcus, the chair of the board. Um, with me are, to my left, board member Didi Dadamo. Um, to my right, board member Tam Dodak, and to her right, board member Joaquin Esquivel. Um, Ms. Hobeck, will you introduce the staff that's assisting today? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Marcus. Um, with me on my left is Assistant Chief Counsel Phil Wiles. On my right, um, my um, Chief Deputies Jonathan Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer. And assisting mm -hmm. today is Janine Townsend, Clerk um, to the Board, and Courtney Tyler. Thank you very much. Um, emergency evacuation procedure for folks who are un familiar with it. There might be one or two people in the audience today who are unfamiliar with it. Um, just look for the exit nearest you, and if you hear an uh, emergency sounding sound, um, pick up your stuff, take your friends, proceed cautiously out of the building by the stairs. If you need help, um, somebody will assist you to a protected area there. Um, strategically located on every floor. Uh, if you want to wait with us uh, to know when it all clear si sounds, um, when we can come back in if, if um, something happens. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we meet at the quarter of 10th and J. Um, there you go. Uh, the meeting's being webcast and recorded, so please speak into the microphone when you uh, come up, not not rock star style, because that creates a popping sound for the folks listening um, on the web, uh, but close enough that it gets picked up, because we do want to make sure that folks on the webcast can hear you. Um, also, please silence any noise-making devices you may have um, to the best of your ability. And those are the basic, uh, those are our basic uh, rules of the day. Um, with that done, we're on to the public forum, and this is the item on the agenda where the board hears from anyone who wishes to speak on an item that is not formally on the agenda. Um, we have one speaker today, uh, Libby Uremovic. Good morning, Ms. Uremovic. Libby Uremovic for Beaumont. Beaumont had a December 31st deadline to submit their $100 million sewer project, expansion, recycle water, brine line, blah, blah, blah. Tonight's their council meeting. Here it is, one page. It's a spreadsheet that says, yep, that was due. $3 million contract to the same person that did the preliminary design, to the same person that did the feasibility study, Albert Webb. They're never going to get $110 million. On Beaumont's uh, agenda is also their 2016 audit that got an adverse opinion because they have no capital assets. Because for the past 25 years, Beaumont has acquired over $300 million worth of bonds and either stole the money or traded it to developers for mitigation fees. And they haven't built any capital assets. All of the roads and the sewers are owned by the developers not the city of Beaumont. Beaumont will never get a clean audit until they get until they do it right and they just won't stop. Can I ask a question? So the audit that's on their agenda tonight is the is 2016. It? They're a year behind. Okay, 20 2015 well, 2016 not over yet, for the so. for for the fiscal year oh, that ended June 30th, 2016. June. All right. So that that audit's all publicly available now. It's, it's going to be agenda. like past tonight. It's uh, I'll I will email you tomorrow when I email it to the SEC. But they never properly accounted for the money. They're hiding the six hundred million dollars in liability that they have, and there's forged assets, and they just can't do that. Real quickly, regional San Gregorio Pass Regional Water Alliance, October twenty fifth, twenty seventeen. All the members got together to say, where are we going to get money to buy water? Because we have thousands and thousands of houses approved, but there is no water. All of the basins are in overdraft. San Gregorio Pass Water Agency, November 6, uh, discussing potential methods of future funding supplies. Where are they going to get money for water? Uh, Beaumont Cherry Valley Water District. 
discussions of regional water supply portfolio and funding strategies and regional needs. The, the bottom line is all of these water agencies up there are in overdraft, all of them together. Next week, I'm going to bring you a map that shows you how this area is. These people are all in overdraft. They've all got thousands of houses listed and they don't know where they're going to get the water because they don't want to charge the developers mitigation fees to pay for the water, to pay for the end of structure. Beaumont tried to run that illegal uh, sewer increase and they took it off because it's illegal. You can't just charge people sewer fees. It, they, they, and they refuse to charge them, you know, the developers. But the state is going to have to step in. Beaumont is never going to get bonds. Beaumont has until February 22nd to resubmit their financial statements. It's not just a federal requirement, it is also GAAP. The, 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 the uh, accounting association requires these financial statements to be resubmitted, clean financial statements. And they just, they haven't even started. They, they, I don't know what they're doing, but that's where you're at. You're going to have to put a cease and desist on it because there's just, they're never going to be able to comply. Beaumont has been 25 years waiting for recycled water and they're not even looking at doing that at all. So, all right, have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Um, next, uh, the minutes of the December 5th through 6th board meeting. Do I have a motion? Move for adoption of the minutes. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. That carries. Um, and now, uh, current hydrologic conditions. Thank you. I got really excited when I saw a headline that said rapid falling snow this weekend in the Sierras, and then I read the story. A light dusting that will melt immediately. Had a moment of uh, cheer. Look at them. They can resend it from their phones. Send it to me? Okay. Watch this. All in real time, live action. Talk amongst yourselves. She's just so surprised that she got it so early that she missed it. <laughs> Word to the wise. It'd be really nice if everybody sent her their, their uh, presentations as early as they're supposed to, as long as I have this moment for an infomercial. That would be, that's not just for her benefit, it's for our benefit in preparing for the hearing. So I'm speaking for myself. Hmm? All right. I'm trying to help you over here. I just want you to know. What? Yeah. Right. Let it be noted on Tuesday, December 19th at 921. <laughs> it shall be reflected. <laughs> well, I do the minutes. I'm not reflecting that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning, board members, everyone. My name is Chris Kwan. To my left is Vadim Demchuk. We are Division of Water Rights, Bay Delta Sacramento Unit, and we're presenting 
Item number two, hydrology update on the Bay Delta watershed. So due to a persistent high pressure system, we haven't had much rain in the last month since the beginning of December. Uh, precip for the Northern Sierra is at 12.3, only jumping from 11.9 two weeks ago. And this is 90% of historical average to this date. Let's look, I mean, the key, just for the people who don't understand it, you just really have to look at the light blue to see how we're doing compared to average. We were doing pretty well last month. But. With that segue, thank you. We have, oops, this figure shows us hmm. that we have lots of month to month variability. A month ago, we talked about year to year variability. We deal with in California, and this figure suggests that we also have to deal with a lot of month to month variability. Last month, we have nearly double the average rainfall, but this year, this month, we have a lot less than average. For San Joaquin, we are at 4.8 precip index. No change from two weeks ago. And it, right now it is 50% of historical average. For Tulare, we're at 2.0 index. Also no change from two weeks ago, and we are at 31% of historical average. For our reservoirs, just like last two weeks, uh, only Lake Paris and Oroville are not at, or at least at historical averages. Oroville is still at 700, 700 feet elevation uh, maintaining that elevation while they're preparing and fixing the emergency spillway. It's good that Millerton's still above average. Sounds good. Hopefully it stays that way. For Kachuma, 37% of capacity, no change from two weeks ago. Diamond Valley, 90% of capacity, also no change from two weeks ago. About 44% of California is either abnormally dry or moderately dry in drought. Uh, hopefully it doesn't get too much more and it's all centered in Southern California and parts of Central California. I'm gonna wait a month to break out the Pepsi. And we'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. I have a couple of questions. Go back to the slide, <clears throat> uh, reservoir levels. And um, you may not have this information, but uh, it might be useful the next time we get together, especially if we don't end up with any major precipitation events. So just focusing on San Luis Reservoir, do you have information mm -hmm. about the um, uh, carryover um, from uh, uh, in their contracts um, at San Luis Reservoir, and then also um, the state share versus the federal share? We don't have that information with us now, but we'll be sure to have that next time. Okay, and then um, I, I actually uh, recently had a meeting with Fred Federico Barajas, um, mm -hmm. uh, the new Pablo over at uh, the Bureau, and um, it was just really an opportunity to have a meet and greet, but I had suggested that, um, especially if uh, we don't end up with um, some good uh, rainfall and, and snow that uh, maybe they consider coming in with the department just um, as we did in the past and uh, give us an update on what they're thinking about for um, operations and uh, dry potential dry year condition planning. That's a good idea. We, we remember your suggestion a few, few weeks ago and we'll definitely 
be in touch with Pablo on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I'm going to say persistent high pressure system from now on rather than ridiculously resilient ridge because it doesn't upset me as much. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to item number three, the Prop 1 groundwater grant program. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. So, uh, good morning, Chair Marcus, members of the board. Uh, my name is Megan Tosney. I'm in the Division of Financial Assistance. I'm the Bond Section Chief. And I'm here today to present on the amended guidelines for the Proposition 1 Groundwater Grant Program. And with me, I have Robert Reeves. He's the senior over this program. And John Davidson from the Office of Chief Counsel. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Prop 1 allocated 800 million for prevention and cleanup of contaminated groundwater that serves or has serves, served as a source of drinking water. Uh, we initially, or the board initially, adopted the guidelines for this program in May of 2016. They essentially outlined the process to solicit applications, evaluate proposals, and then also include some requirements that apply to funded projects. Uh, and then we are currently finishing our review of the proposals and awarding funds for the first round of funding. The types of projects that we're seeing include planning, uh, remedial investigation, feasibility studies, preliminary design work, and then we're also funding construction projects, including wellhead treatment, extraction wells, groundwater well destruction, and source area cleanup. So in anticipation of the second round of funding that we plan to do in 2018, we've been working on some proposed amendments to the guidelines. We initially released a draft in October. We had a public meeting in Sacramento early November and then a board workshop in Los Angeles on November 8th. The comment period ended shortly thereafter and we ultimately received 16 comment letters. So the next several slides are just sort of an overview of the uh, comments and responses. That's a, a good way to do it. I mean, I know people do it in varying ways, but I thought this was pretty the cleanest I've seen in a long time. Okay, good. So the initial draft proposed a new $50 million cap on implementation projects. We did receive one comment recommending that we eliminate that cap. We ultimately did revise the language to emphasize that that cap is just for funding decisions that um, happen at the division level by the deputy director of the Division of Financial Assistance and that the state board can approve grants exceeding that $50 million cap. But we felt that um, projects of that magnitude, it made sense for the board to see those and consider those. Oops, I went too far. Okay, so recycled water projects was another area where we received a lot of comment. Uh, essentially, the first draft proposed that we would not fund the costs of recycled water treatment. Um, in regards to this program, it really relates to uh, prevention type projects that might involve, involve recharge or injection. And um, we still, in this proposed version that's before you today, are recommending that we can fund the project components that have direct prevention benefits, like the injection wells, for example, but that the cost for recycled water treatment really should be funded through other programs like the Water Recycling Funding Program. 
we did modify the language to make it more clear that the cost of installing recycled water treatment can be considered for match. Uh, this program has a 50% match requirement, so I think that will help make the approach a little bit more palatable to folks. Right, because otherwise, I mean, as I understand it, when you think about it, I don't blame anyone for wanting to maximize how much they can get from any one program to put together for a program, but uh, water recycling could eat this whole pot, and this pot was created for a specific purpose separately. Exactly. So I think the intent was slightly different, although you know, I could be convinced on certain projects in some ways, but I think in general what you proposed is in keeping with the spirit. The next is regarding our definition of contamination. Um, the comment asks that we expand that definition to include um, concentrations that are imposed by the division of drinking water that might be more stringent than the primary maximum contaminant level or notification level. We ultimately are not uh, proposing any changes to this definition. We feel that the uh, definition we have is appropriate for the cleanup and prevention projects that we're trying to target with this program. It is worth noting that we do have an avenue to fund sort of strictly drinking water treatment projects through this program, but that's specifically for disadvantaged communities. So let's say somebody, I mean, I can understand why uh, water purveyor would want to clean something up to beyond the MCL for a variety of reasons as long as they're going to go into a cleanup project. Could the extra money they put into it could be part of the match or not part of the match? Well, I mean, the issue with this definition is it's sort of a key eligibility threshold where we wouldn't necessarily consider a project eligible for our program unless there are concentrations that exceed the MCL that are threatening a drinking water well. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. I mean, it, this might be one of those areas where we might want to, you might want to have it as the, that it could come to us. Because I, yeah, I mean, we there can there could be a situation, that. there are times when you have secondary standards that are preventing people from drinking their water which is a big issue out there. I'm not saying it's not technically safe to drink, but it's impeding the ability of people to actually be able to get water because nobody wants to drink it. So I, I can envision that, but I wouldn't want to open the barn door too widely. Okay, we can keep that in mind. Uh, let's see, so the next is regarding uh, eligible projects and preferences. We had a comment that recharge projects should be uh, weighted equally with cleanup projects. We ultimately aren't uh, recommending any changes in this area. Uh, recharge projects could potentially be eligible, but it's important that the proposal demonstrates cleanup and prevention benefits to be eligible for this program. We also had a, a comment on eligibility and preferences that indicated we should have more of a focus on areas with widespread impacts from non-point sources or multiple difficult to identify sources. And this comment was really geared towards um, CV salts and those efforts. Uh, we are not recommending any changes to the eligibility. We feel that these types of projects can be considered based on the existing language and the guidelines. We did add some mention of salt and nutrient management planning to a couple of sections that have to do with, you know, priorities and preferences and that sort of thing. We had a comment asking for language to ensure confidentiality protections for uh, both sensitive information that might relate to water system security and also privileged or confidential information that uh, might relate to efforts to recover costs from responsible parties. We didn't really feel with that this level of detail was necessary in the guidelines themselves, but we're definitely willing to consider a case by case when we're negotiating the grant agreement with individual recipients. There was also a comment asking for more detailed information on the costs of the technical advisory committee requirement and also um, a request that there we include language to ensure consideration of costs in developing the post-construction monitoring requirements. Uh, it, we did not include specific costs regarding the costs 
the specific costs regarding the technical advisory committee, we felt that they were gonna vary a lot from project to project, but at the end of the day, we anticipate they'll be minor in comparison to the overall project costs. And uh, we did add language to section 10.10, .10, uh, making it clear that we will consider costs in developing those post-construction monitoring requirements. And then we had various commenters that um, commented in regards to this program, its accessibility for disadvantaged communities, that sort of thing. We received uh, comments and support for the inclusion of septic to sewer projects, uh, also the addition of the maximum $50 million cap for implementation projects, and also the intent to reserve $300 million for the 2020 solicitation. This was um, an intent to try to ensure that planning projects that are being funded now as part of round one have time to come to fruition and compete for implementation funds. Uh, there were some recommended changes to preferences and match requirements. We ultimately did make some clarifying edits there and we also discussed a lot of those comments with the commenters to clarify how this program interacts with the SRF program specifically for drinking water, wastewater. And we're gonna continue to work on some of their other recommended actions for outreach and coordination to identify eligible DAC projects. And that's it. You can handle the issue I raised too, so fine. That's good. Uh, I know you all have worked really hard and done uh, myriad meetings with folks to try, so thank you. I mean, um, nicely done. We have a couple of comments, so I wanna hear what um, folks have to say, but there, are there any other questions before we go to comments? All right, all right. Two sets of comments, one from uh, two people from the Soquel Creek Water District, um, Melanie Schumacher and Ron Duncan. Nice to see you. Um, followed by uh, Deborah Orris from the Community Water Center. Hi. Thank Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Ron Duncan, the general manager with Soquel Creek Water District, and I have my colleague, Melanie Mal Schumacher, with me also, another manager. Last time we spoke uh, to the board uh, was down at Metropolitan Water District, if you may remember, and um, because you could feel the enormity of that space and, and, and that itself, we made the comment that uh, we generally say Soquel is a, a small or medium-sized water district along the coast just uh, adjacent to Santa Cruz. And uh, Chair Marcus actually uh, downgraded us to teeny tiny uh, at that. At I'm the, sorry. Itty bitty. I'm sorry, itty bitty, uh, which is maybe appropriate. No pejorative. <laughs> it's in, in term of endearment. I, I know that. And, and, it, and it was in a good joking manner, and we appreciate <laughs> it uh, in the sense of the, that it came from. Uh, however, we do have big problems. We are a, a small or a tiny uh, community, about 50,000 strong, uh, but we have seawater intrusion. Uh, it's detected in about one third of our coastal monitoring wells. And we recently collaborated with the uh, country of Denmark and their scientists. And they did uh, what's only been done, I think, uh, right around Denmark. They flew offshore a helicopter with a geophysical tool and kind of filled in the missing piece of the puzzle where the seawater intrusion off is offshore, where we can't detect it in our monitoring wells onshore, but how far offshore is it? And what the conclusion in that study is, is it's about as close to onshore as it can be without being onshore. So the heightened sense of urgency is, is there. Um, so, you know, we are a critically overdrafted base, and so it's important. Our problem, why we are teeny tiny, uh, our problems are big uh, with our community. So, but that's just who we are. What we really came here today was express our appreciation for the board and the staff. Uh, Melanie's gonna really get into this in a second, but from my point of view, it's the process that I appreciate. And, and looking through the comments and the way that's been, been addressed, we feel that, you know, while everything we asked for certainly wasn't uh, provided, and we understand that you gotta do the best you can with the state's money, um, the process was fair, the deliberation, and we believe the outcomes too. And I think Melanie wants to add to that. Yeah, I just wanted to add, we often get a lot of people who come to our meetings and, and they voice their opinions and they complain. And then when we incorporate things, sometimes they don't show, show up at the next meeting. And so we just wanted to come and express 
um, you know, thank you for listening to us. We really do appreciate it. We've been working um, on our planning grant with Leslie's staff and Joe and Megan and Robert and Aaron for some time. We do look forward to moving our planning grant to the next level, hopefully. And then again, you know, with the guideline changes, we really want to be the kind of agency that is a shining star where we are putting this Prop 1 groundwater grant money to use to implement a project, to be a shining star and be a prevention project along the coast. As a sole groundwater agency, we don't get imported water. So this is critical to us. This is why we drive up to Sacramento. This is why we fly down to LA. And it's why we continue to want to create that relationship. Our, our kind of theme in our community right now is we used to thank people for conserving water. And they're now down to 50 gallons per person per day. And they're you know complaining about their water rates going up as they're conserving more. And we've switched our message to thank you for caring about our water. And again, it's that kind of, kind of connection of caring for small agencies like ourselves. We really do appreciate it. So thank you. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. I do think that people sometimes think of government agencies as out there when it's actually a collection of people trying to use the tools they have, and that, that human connection is important. And our, our team really likes to be one-stop shop to sit down and understand your project and figure out how to cobble together the funding sources we have. So um, thank you for taking the time to come up. And thank you for the thank you. Classy. Uh, next, Ms. Oris, good to see you. Sorry, my voice is still a little hoarse. Um, good morning, uh, board. Lord, I'm just here to thank staff for working with us um, both before submitting comments and after um, sitting our submitting our comments to kind of clarify some of the issues we addressed in our comment letter. And we just want to uh, express our support. And I'm also here on behalf of uh, Clean Water Action Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all of your partnership on things with us, too. Please tell everybody to have a happy holiday. All right. Further questions or comments? Just want to thank staff. Um, you know, it, it says a lot when you have uh, folks come back and just make a point to compliment staff's work. And particularly as a public agency, you know, uh, what has been a thrill to be on this board is uh, really the the public participation process that that we have. Um, it is what makes us strong. I think when it comes to the crafting of regulations. Um, and really, I think the effectiveness of, of our program speaks to that. So anyway, just want to thank staff uh, for the great work. Thank you. Well said, too. Great. Um, do we have a motion? Ditto on the thanks, and I move for adoption of this item. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries. Thanks for the great work. Item number four, adoption of an order amending the general permit for stormwater discharges from small municipal separate storm sewer systems. Say that three times fast. Hence the title MS4.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, good morning, uh, Chair Marcus, uh, members uh, Diadamo, uh, Dudok, and Esquivel. I appreciate you uh, listening to me today. Um, I'm Bill Harris of the Municipal Stormwater Unit, and I'm pleased to present the item before you now, an amendment to implement the total maximum daily loads uh, for the small MS4 general permit. Thank you. I would like to start by giving you a brief introduction to the total maximum daily load or uh, TMDL's requirements. I'm sure you're well versed, but for our audience today, uh, TMDLs are requirements specific to an impaired water body and the pollutant causing the impairment. They have load allocations or waste load allocations that are then assigned to dischargers of the watershed. TMDLs have final compliance dates and have been adopted by the regional water boards into their respective basin plans. But due to the fact that uh, basin plans are not self-implementing, TMDL requirements are typically implemented through MPDES permits. Therefore, the amendment before you today seeks to include these TMDL requirements into the small MS4 MPDES permit. The amendment before you today proposes changes to three documents associated with, this, with the permit. Uh, first, revisions were made to the general TMDL provisions in the main body of the permit. Secondly, the changes are made to the fact sheet to conform to the changes in the main body of the permit. And attachment G uh, was also edited and um, to include the implementation requirements. Uh, attachment G includes specific implementation actions for each water body pollutant combination for the permittees that discharge into the watershed of the impaired water body and includes final attainment dates of the waste load allocations. This amendment makes revisions to those specific requirements. The proposed revisions to the main body of the permit include modifying finding 40 and revising the TMDL related provisions applicable generally to all permittees. These establish how implementation of the requirements in attachment G relate to the broader requirements in the order to achieve the TMDL waste load allocations and ultimately to meet the receiving water limitations. The proposed revisions also include one non-TMDL related change and that is to add an annual report due date. The proposed revisions to the fact sheet include the basis for each of the 75 TMDLs included in the amendment. Uh, these, this includes the rationale to include each of the entities named, the waste load allocations prescribed by the TMDL, and the final waste load allocation or load allocation attainment date, and if, if applicable, and an explanation on how the proposed requirements will attain the specific waste load allocation. The proposed revision in attachment G include the provision the proposed implementation requirements, excuse me, applicable to the named entities under each TMDL. The proposed amendment revises the requirements for 75, did I just, yeah, for the 75 water body pollutant combinations. Um, included are revisions um, to specific control measures and or planning requirements, reporting requirements, and applicable monitoring requirements. The proposal also includes the final attainment date of the waste load allocation. A significant issue that was identified, are we on slide seven? Okay. A significant issue that was identified during the public process is that there are several permittees that will be subject to the TMDL requirements where attainment dates have passed. This would require any permittee in this position to demonstrate immediate attainment of the waste allocation. In order to accommodate this issue, um, the proposed amendment is considering a one year extension of the effective date of the permit. This would allow time for permittees in the position of immediate compliance to work with the regional board on options, including obtaining time schedule orders. The proposed amendment also offers some legal protection for good faith efforts. There are three specific cases that are addressed. If the regional board makes a determination that the TMDL, TMDL itself offers flexibility to extend the deadline for attainment, the executive director may amend attachment G following a public process and uh, to extend the attainment deadline. Where the deadline is passed and a demonstration of attainment has not been completed, 
a time schedule or may be requested. It is not the intention of the water boards to take enforcement if the permittee is working in good faith to obtain the time schedule order. And thirdly, it is not the intention of the water boards to take enforcement action if the regional board has reopened the TMDL to amend the waste load allocation or compliance deadline. Uh, the public outreach that was conducted by the State Water Board staff um, started in June 2015 uh, when we released a draft amendment. In August of 2015, we held workshops throughout the state. In June 2017, we contacted newly named entities to let them know that they had been identified as being subject to this amendment. In June 2017, we published a draft amendment for public comment and on August 21st, 2017, the public comment period was closed. The proposed amendment before you today was published on December 7th, 2017. The public process highlighted several areas where revisions uh, needed, were needed to be made to clarify rec requirements or to rectify errors. Specific revisions made to address uh, the major issues include Inclusion of several methods that permittees can use to demonstrate attainment of their waste load allocation. Establishment uh, for procedure of a procedure for uh, obtaining a time schedule order and clarification as described in the previous slide of the water board's enforcement discretion. Placement of California Polytechnic uh, Pomona or Cal Poly Pomona into the correct watershed of the mm -hmm. San Gabriel River and inclusion of the appropriate TMDLs for that watershed. And lastly, a proposal to extend the effective date of the permit to January 1st, 2019 to allow permittees time to request time schedulers and or to demonstrate attainment of their waste load allocation. This proposed change has um, been uh, documented or was uh, submitted as a change sheet and is in the back of the room for uh, people in attendance today. Oh, and it's also published on our agenda for people on the web. Excuse me. So uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present for you today. Uh, my contact information is displayed here and I'm able to answer any questions you may have at this time. Oh, and, and uh, <laughs> I apologize. The people sitting, I have Diana Messina here today, my supervisor, Galene uh, Pereira, my uh, unit chief, and uh, Mel Wadwani of the OCC also presenting. Thank you, that's today. helpful Sorry. for the folks who are listening and yeah. not watching online. Thank you, good, oh, good My tip. bad, thank you. And Chair Marcus. I should have caught that. Tam should have caught that. <laughs> she catches everything. That's good. Good catch. Before we proceed to the yes. comments, I wanted to address one communication that we received this morning um, from the California Coastkeeper Alliance from Sean Bothwell. Um, and Janine, this is a surprise to you, but I, I, you have it? Great. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, they've been very involved in these proceedings and have participated all along, but the communication said that they're not able to be here today and wanted to raise one concern based on the um, revised draft that was uh, released with the agenda 10 days ago. And here's the concern. Um, it refers to Section D and Section E15A3 of the uh, revised um, order itself. This is in the order itself. And um, Coastkeeper has been raising concerns with having any kind of safe harbor in the permit. This specifically, um, they stated specifically to those sections, we are concerned that no study or theoretically an RAA, a reasonable assurance analysis was conducted to determine whether the BMPs and attachment G are sufficient to actually meet the interim or final waste load allegations. So I wanted to explain what these provisions do and why we think this is not a safe harbor. The, this is the reference language. The first is section D. This is not all of section D, but the new language in section D. And it says, if a permittee fully complies with the applicable requirements and deadlines in attachment G for a specific pollutant and water body, including, the including, and this is important, the requirement to demonstrate attainment of the applicable waste load allocation in accordance with sections E15A and um, F5I1, those are the sections that lay out how you demonstrate compliance of this order. The permittee is deemed to be in compliance with this section's requirement that discharge does not cause or contribute to an exceedance of water quality standards for that specific pollutant and water body. In, a sense, in, in essence, what this is saying is that if a permittee is complying with the requirements in attachment G, the TMDL requirements, for a specific water body and pollutant combination, 
including the requirement in that section to demonstrate attainment of the waste load allocation at the final compliance deadline, then that permittee is in compliance with the receding water limitations. Um, and As this, I understand this, it, that's how we always That's how do we it. always. We, we did the extra level when we had an alternative compliance. Right. In and some permits, because the folks were asking us to cut them some kind of slack. Exactly. But when we have a TMDL but they still established, have to, okay. When we have a TMDL established, we don't require compliance both with the TMDL and the receiving water limitations. The compliance with the TMDL requirements is compliance with the receiving water limitations. And the second section essentially says exactly the same thing. It's um, referring back to section D and saying that um, as long as the permittee is following the demonstration they have to do in one in sections one and two, which are both the BMP-based demonstrations and the demonstration that the waste load allocation is attained at the final deadline, that that permittee is de deemed compliant with the receiving water so, limitations but as well. Just can, just can you, um, for folks who aren't necessarily uh, experts and steeped in the various levels of things sure. we do, whether basin plans, TMDLs, permits, et cetera, when you say that, what's the temporal aspect of it? You're saying they're deemed in compliance if they're They've got to be in compliance by the deadline. That's sort of right. the absolute drop dead. What's the deemed in compliance prior to that drop dead date? Uh, what exactly do they have to have done leading right. up to that? So the, the permit as a baseline establishes that you have to uh, not cause or contribute to exceedances of water quality standards in the receiving waters. That's the baseline in all of our municipal storm, all of our permits, but also municipal storm water. The TMDLs are established when that water body is not meeting that, that standard, and it's a way of bringing the permittee into compliance with the receiving water limitations ultimately. The way we have set up this permit for the duration of the implementation schedule that's allowed in the TMDL, the permittee is demonstrating compliance by implementing certain um, control measures, planning requirements, monitoring. Um, and during that period of time, they're in compliance with the TMDL and with the receiving water limitations, as long as they're meeting those requirements. So, so that what, how would they be out of compliance? They would be out of compliance during that period of time they if they're doing not anything or they implementing doing enough. If, sorry, what was? Yeah, sorry. I just I'm trying to make it concrete. Sure. For so during that period, they are not in compliance if they are not implementing what they are required to implement under attachment G. That may be a specific control measure that has to be in place by a certain date. It may be a certain plan that has to be submitted to the regional board laying out the measures that they're going to take to come into compliance. But, but there are specific actions that they're required to take by certain dates during that time period. So they don't get to sit back and wait until the end of the TMDL period and say, whoops. They do not, no. And the, what we've done, what the regional boards have done, is they've looked at these control measures and made a determination with some level of confidence that they think the control measures are the right measures to bring the permittee eventually into compliance with the TMDL requirement, with the, allow the permittee to eventually achieve, attain the waste load allocation that the TMDL requires. We have also been very careful to say that Ultimately, we're looking for the water quality results. Right. So there's a period of time in which the um, control measures and planning are the requirements that the permittees are on the hook for. But ultimately, when you reach the end of the implementation schedule in the TMDL and our basin plans, the permittee has to demonstrate that the waste load allocation, which expresses the water quality result, has been attained. So there, there isn't an indefinite uh, period of, of relying only on BMPs and, and planning to um, uh, be in compliance with the permit. So I'm going to say it in a much simpler way. Okay. <laughs> the, I thought that was pretty good, so go take it away. So the TMDL has a specific pollutant that it's addressing. And it, um, when the TMDL was adopted, there was... Um, the water, receiving water was, <clears throat> the water body was not in compliance with that pollutant. It sets out a series of measures to bring the water body into compliance. So during the time that that TMDL is in effect, you're in compliance if you're meeting the requirements in that TMDL. 
And at the end of the day, um, you will need to meet the um, demonstrate that you're meeting the um, waste load allocation. Right. So what happens during that process? I don't know why I'm turning this into like TMDL 101, but um, during that during that process, let's say you know good faith, everything the the uh, regional board set their TMDL for that contaminant. People are doing exactly what they thought at the time would happen, but there's either a concern or an awareness that they're not. It's not going to be enough to meet that. There, I'm presuming there's a conversation because the permittee is still on the hook to meet the result at the end of the day. So I guess the question is, what do you do when you know that maybe it's not going to make it? So there, there's two pathways that that produces. One is that um, that the specific measures that were in the TMDL um, <clears throat> were not adequate to, to meet the TMDL. Um, that would mean that generally the TMDL was um, flawed and needs to be reevaluated. We have a process in the uh, for looking at our TMDL results. It's in our um, our performance report. Looking at the uh, data, um, the end of the compliance period. If the TMDL is not being met, the TMDL needs to be reevaluated. There's another um, issue, which is so a permittee is um, has specific requirements to meet their waste load allocations. And they are required to develop plans and, and um, implement BMPs that would meet those. And if those for that individual permittee fail to actually meet the waste load allocation at the end, they're out of compliance with the permit. They have to then work with the regional board to, to come into compliance, figure out how they're going to come into compliance. That could be a time schedule order. That could be a... Um, a enforcement order, but at the end of the day, they still have to meet the water, the receiving water limits for that pollutant. Okay, that concludes our lecture for the day. Appreciate that. I know people are, don't understand that. No, thank you for that. That was very um, helpful. I have a, more elucidating questions, but I think I'll move on to the speaker if people don't. Any questions or observations or anything before we start? All right. We just have uh, one card, um, a two-person presentation, uh, Jeff Rousseau from Casqua and uh, Kay Ashby. You're going to have a little more time if you need it. Oh, and those are going to be a quiz. See if we've got. That's uh... because that doesn't make any sense, does it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're seeing the something right on our screen. Thing. You're not. All right, there we go. Thank you. Oops. There we go. Good morning, Chair Marcus and board members. Uh, my name is Jeff Brasso. I'm the Executive Director for the California Stormwater Quality Association, or CASQA. Thank you for giving us a little additional time this morning to uh, make a relatively short presentation. I'll make the first part, and then Karen Ashby, who's with Larry Walker Associates and our regulatory consultant, will make the second part of the presentation. Um, as you may know, speaking of public processes, we've been involved, obviously, in this process for quite some time, as, as is our way. Starting, We have our, our time starting, actually, in 2013. Uh, through some early kickoff meetings and consultations, and then from the more formal process starting in 2015 into the, into the current year. Uh, we submitted comment letters a couple of summers ago, and then again this past summer. We would like also, again, in the spirit of the of the holidays and spirit of the moment uh, today, thank staff for engaging with us every step of the way and and being very helpful and constructive, and and uh, we really appreciate that. I think we think as uh, as we remember Escobar said that Bruce is a better product in the end, and and we're all better for it, so we really appreciate that. Um, upon review of the revised proposed amendments and the response to comments and the change sheet from last night, um, we'd like to formally recognize the modifications that have been made to the, to, the, to the order itself. And we have just a couple of critical issues we'd like to talk to you about um, before the, the order is adopted. 
Uh, given the fiscal impact of the TMDL implementation requirements and the fact that this is the first time that TMDLs and the requirements are being incorporated into the permit, even though many, several have passed their, their attainment dates, CASCA believes that it's important to address these issues prior to, to adoption itself. Um, we've got sort of two key issues and three requests, although one of the requests was, I think, mostly dealt with last night through the change through the change sheet. Um, our key requests focus on issues that are of statewide importance, of course, and affect the implementation of most, if not all, the TMDLs included in the permit. Our are intended to provide recommend, recommendations that address, one, the, uh, the process for permittees that are subject to TMDLs that have passed their attainment dates, and we, that's maybe been addressed, and then how attainment or, or, of or compliance with TMDL provisions needs to be demonstrated by MS4s. Um, as you're well aware, of course, how the team deals are incorporated into this permit will likely set some precedent. Uh, the, the industrial general permit is up for a very similar action next year, likely, and so we're interested in focusing on that. We've got, as, as, as the slide says, we've got three requests. I would say one of them was really addressed by the change sheet last night, but I'll maybe, rather than selling something that's been sold once already, I'll just maybe give you some support for why we think those changes are necessary. The second request is really not a change in the, in the order, it's really just a request to work with us going forward. And then Karen's gonna go through some changes um, we're requesting as a third. So the first one is, uh, it was to <laughs> extend the effective date of the permit essentially to, um, to, to either the permit actually is reissued again or to Jan January 1st, 2019, which is the change sheet changes it to 2019. Um, as you know, the TMDL provisions such as waste allocations and load allocations are not self-implementing. That was mentioned this morning already. They become effective when the permit is amended to include the provisions that are consistent with the waste allocations. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond the control of small MS4s, many of the TMDLs were adopted in the years past and are now being incorporated into the general permit. There's a relatively large portion. Our estimate is that there's about uh, about. 40% uh, of the, uh, or about 23 TMDLs that are in attachment G are actually either past their attainment dates or will be in the next couple of years, so which essentially is sort of now in TMDL timelines. Um, although the proposed order states that the, in these situations, permittees may request a time schedule order or work with the region board, uh, both these actions require significant time to implement. So again, we really do support adding at least another six months, so making it to January 1. 2019 is really going to be really going to be helpful. The second request uh, has to do with ag agreeing to work with us um, going forward on uh, on, this, on the idea of compliance schedules and the epic compliance schedule policy. Uh, Casca previously requested that the small MS4 permit be amended to allow permittees to propose in permit compliance schedules. Uh, State Board staff in their response to comments stated that they do not believe that the board has the legal flexibility to uh, allow permittees to obtain in-permit compliance schedules. And they, fully, they actually believe, they further believe that the compliance schedule policy is not applicable to MS4 permits specifically. Um, so given the significance of TMDL final attainment dates and the resulting impact on MS4, we'd like to have a conversation with staff after this to talk about can we, in the, maybe the next year or so, can we look at the idea of compliance schedules and see if we can get some, maybe make some changes to the compliance schedule policy itself to allow for that kind of, that kind of mechanism as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen to go talk about some specific requests. We're going to third and I'll set that up here. Yeah, it's just on the right, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so one thing that I wanna recognize is we, uh, in looking at the revised um, or the proposed order, um, there's a specific um, section of language, E15A and B, that were added, lots of yellow highlights in that area. Um, we tried to be very respectful of that language, but identify some surgical edits that we would like to request. I'm gonna go through the highlights of those. There's some other um, more important but minor compared to the ones I'd like to mention that we're requesting. I do have handouts. Um, and so we were asked to wait until right now. If it's helpful, we'd be happy to hand you the language so you can see no, that's what it is we're asking trying for. To scribble fast. Yeah, no, you no need to scribble. Yeah, can you hand it? Thank you. Thank you. 
You will okay. have to talk through it, though, for the people listening. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think this will just help put it into context. Okay, so in our July 2017 comment letter, CASCA recommended that the order include language that explicitly identifies how compliance with the permit may be determined. In response to our comments, State Water Board staff included new language within the permit body as well within each one of the TMDLs in attachment G. And we were very pleased that this change was made and felt like it was critically important. While we, while we are very happy about this, we do have some, some specific, I would call them surgical edits, that we are recommending to ensure Thanks. that the compliance options are consistent with the range of TMDLs that have been de developed throughout the state. And again, because this is a statewide permit, we're trying to make sure that the different compliance pathways that may be out there are recognized within the permit. Given that this language was, first, was provided for the first time on December 8th, CASCA recommends that the State Water Board consider the revisions that we are proposing prior to adoption of the order. Okay, so I'm gonna go through each one of these. So under E15A, uh, we have several um, changes that I'll go through. I think there's four in total that, that I'll walk through. So for E15A2A, um, we're requesting um, some, some strikeout or some modified language because, because attainment of the receiving water should be assessed um, within the water body as a whole or at key monitoring locations that are specified within the TMDL and not necessarily at each MS4 discharge location. So what we're basically trying to say with this first edit is we recognize that a lot of the TMDLs will set up within the monitoring plans themselves specific locations where attainment is assessed or, or, and we want to have that recognized within this language instead of just assuming that attainment um, of the receiving water um, objective is actually immediately downstream of the permittees discharge. We feel that this is too specific um, of language. Okay, for the next one. Are the monitoring attainment locations set up with regard to each of the permittees, or are they just references to um, the overall assessment of the TMDL? I mean, you'd still need to know. Let's assume you're, you're monitoring. Correct me, Jonathan, or anyone if yeah. I'm wrong here. You're setting up attainment locations to assess the attainment of the TMDL as a whole, but you still kind of need to know if the permittee is contributing to it, right? I mean, I, there, the two are distinct things you need to know. I, think I don't just, think it's an either or. If, can I just give you my opinion on that really quickly? Is that it depends on how the TMDL is written. There are TMDLs that are written that are very that very specifically say monitoring locations are here, here, and here, and this is how attainment with the TMDL will be assessed. It's not necessarily always immediately downstream of a permittee's discharge. But if a permittee is required to demonstrate compliance with a numeric waste load allocation, then yes, I would agree with you. There's, there's, it, it depends on where the, the monitoring locations are defined within the TMDL. And I'll respectfully let Jonathan. So um, I, I think that I totally agree with what, what Ashley's saying is that they are actually two different issues. And um, um, we don't disagree with, um, with the change, but we would say that it should be an or because yeah, that's what um, I if the um, TMDL is, is being met at the TMDL compliance, it's irrelevant what the down, uh, uh, downstream is, but if it's not being met, it may be very relevant that they're, cause, they're not causing or contributing to the impairment at their discharge location. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah. And again, we're trying to thread that needle for, you know, 75 to 100 right. TMDLs, so it does get difficult. Okay, so um, for the next um, uh, modification, E15A2D, um, we're asking um, for some language to be struck, and the rationale for that is that when TMDLs typically have group allocations, it's usually allocated literally to the group as a whole and measured as a whole, and not unless the TMDL specifies divided up into individual allocations. Unless specifically stated in the TMDL and Basin Plan Amendment, the term appropriate share would invite um, discretion to determine what that share is, which would be inconsistent in our opinion with the Basin Plan Amendment. Meaning, if there is um, an allocation that is given to a whole, let's say there's an MS4 allocation, which a lot of TMDLs have, 
um, then kind of as a group has to kind of demonstrate that compliance. If all of a sudden you're, you're then looking at an appropriate share and that's not defined within the TMDL, you start then getting into a lot of, you know, how is that actually determined, who's determining that, and it departs from the TMDL. What if the TMDL has a share laid out? You said it could be either way depending on the TMDL. Well, I think, I think that, so right there, what it's saying, right, is that you're either attaining your individual allocation or the joint allocation. So I think it already. Well, I see what you're saying. So I, I think it's, it's not always an individual allocation. And I think what the second part of that is trying to do is take a joint allocation down to an individual allocation, which is not always appropriate depending on how the TMDL is written. Could I make a suggestion here? It, yeah. it just seems that there are quite a few uh, changes being recommended here. And although we seem to have the time uh, to go through each one, I'm just thinking it might be helpful to take um, a break where you could have the opportunity to talk with our staff and then um, maybe come back and characterize uh, technical uh, changes that everyone agrees to versus those that would merit um, some further discussion. I it might, it might be a better a good use idea. Of time. I was going to just listen to it all because I'm in a geeky mood today, but that's probably, and then take <laughs> I a know, break. It's, it's sad. So but this probably is, yeah. that, uh, <laughs> thank true. you very much. Why don't we do that? It's that's time perfect. for mid-morning break. So let's, let's break for a good uh, 15 minutes and we will come back. Let's come back at uh, 1055. And if you need more time, just let us know. Sure. Make it 11. Yeah. There you go. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate that.
So, um, I'd just like to report back that we have come to consensus on what we're going to approve. Um, Amel is just um, doing version control to make sure, because the document that they had was um, slightly out of date, so there were a few uh, changes. So she's making the changes on a on the most ver recent version. We'll bring him back to propose to you in, in a minute.
So um, there's a couple ways we could do Can this. Can I say one other thing first? Yeah. We are reconvening at uh, 1123. That's all right. If it took longer, it was productive. That's fine. It's not like we ha I hope you don't mind waiting. I so. just kept thinking I wanted to know what you guys thought. <laughs> so No, that's good. The only thing is that this way we haven't said what we thought beforehand, but I still think that's, I think it's fine. I, we'll see. We can raise it now. So there's a couple of ways to do this. Okay. Um, Mel's got the um, changes to the actual document. I was thinking that um, it might be easier since we were going through this document that we received from uh, Casco that we could just go through and talk in general, and then she can show you the, sure. uh, anyway. the um, changes that reflect that. Does that make sense enough? Whatever you like. No, uh, you all have. We have this to go through what it was they suggested, some of which was taken. So I'm just going to go through the same way we did in there, um, which is pretty curt. So if you have any questions, jump in. Um, on the first page, um, it's an editorial compliance determination where we do not propose to take that. That's not necessary. Okay. In the second item, um, there's an or, or more. We're not proposing to take that. It's editorial. Um, <clears throat> on 2A, this is the first substantive, and um, Amel can show you the language. We are accepting it, but um, as an addition and not a replacement. No, that's what I was suggesting. Okay. So it's... Okay. Um, Okay. And um, if we turn to the second page, there's um, a couple of, of editorials that we are not accepting that um, permittees MS4 or multiple permittees. We are accepting the uh, um, under D um, the, the removal of appropriate share because that's re uh, redundant. It's already been taken care of. Okay. Um, under number F, this a new F that they proposed, mm -hmm. or new, yeah, new F that they proposed um, about DMA, uh, DNA sampling. Do you see that on her there? We are um, not proposing to accept that, and the reason for that is that we have a bacteria objective change that is working through the process that includes um, information about um, um, natural source exclusions and DNA sampling, and that'll be coming before you in this next year. And also the the need so for- So should the, wait for the formal change. Right, right. And the need for this is actually um, already addressed in the um, the, the specific TMDL that, would, um, that this was uh, proposed for is actually addressed in the uh, generally in the other language and can be covered. So there was no need for the, um, for the specific change. Um, the same with H. We're not proposing to accept H um, because if there is a, um, if the TMDL actually has a um, a BMP based final effluent limit, which I don't believe there are any are, but if there is, um, those are already uh, um, taken in the one below, which says specific requirements for um, in the TMDL. And then, um, so we go on to the next page. We are um, we're not taking any of those because we actually covered that issue in the change sheet in a, in a slightly different way. Um, but we are we have the same endpoint, but it's already been done in the change sheet. And. Did I miss one? No, you didn't miss one, but I just realized that the date of July 1 is still up there, and in the chain sheet that went out yesterday, that would be um, January 1, 2019. So we've already covered that change. Yeah. It just right. doesn't appear here. Right, right. So you might want to change that before it goes in the record. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, it's already in the chain sheet. It just wasn't reflected in there. Um, document. Okay. Oh, they also. I'm sorry. I skipped a major one. They. Uh, yeah. They also proposed the uh, insertion into the um, 
the permit about looking at a compliance schedule policy that would override TMDL's um, compliance dates. We don't think it's appropriate to put it in the permit. Um, I'll be happy to discuss with the board if they want us to look into it um, as a, you know, potential uh, policy change that the board would have to adopt. There are um, ramifications that we're not, we haven't investigated yet um, that would make it um, um, premature to put it into the permit. Well, it seems almost premature to direct you to do a policy as well. I was thinking just have a conversation and then report back to us. Yes, exactly. And then figure out how you feel about it, pros and cons, and we can. So what we will do is we will look into and um, and also I think this has a lot of impact with the regional boards and the NGOs to look into the. Uh, yeah, you'd need to have a conversation about whether it's the cost benefit of the time spent because right. we're doing so many policies. We just keep loading them on you. It it may well be that it has value, but you should have the conversation just to e explore thinking about it further and then. So. Um, my recommendation is that we come back to you in, say, six months. Um, mm -hmm. um, either, <coughs> why don't we just plan to come back to you with either do it in the executive director's report or in briefings. Okay. okay. That's okay with me at least, sorry. I think that's it, is it? All right, so I'm gonna add two things. Um, so this, these changes, are in addition to the changes in change sheet one that were, was circulated yesterday. Also, I have one, two, three here. One, revise the E15 as we show here. There's an identical language in section F5I of the order for non-traditional permittees. This language only applies to traditional permittees. So you're directing us to make the corresponding revisions, the exact same changes oh, sure. to the identical language in F5I, and then to the extent any conforming changes are needed to the fact sheet, the staff will make those changes. Um, and finally, um, I, I'm going to represent, unless Jeff would like to come up, that, um, that Casco agrees with all the uh, changes. All right, that was a productive conversation. Are there any Questions about those changes, comments, heartburn? All right. Do I have a motion to adopt it with the change sheet and these changes, including the, th you know, three things on that page? Move adoption of item four with the change sheet and the revisions uh, proposed by staff. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, it carries. Thanks. Thanks for the time. Thanks a lot. And you'll be getting back to Coast Keeper about the stuff you found. All right, good. Great. Uh, item number five, board member report. Looking. Anything to report? Um, I participated in the uh, San Joaquin Valley Partnership meeting oh, on great. the, this says the 18th. It wasn't the 18th. I don't remember when it was though. And um, we had um, an item on um, SB 623, oh. as well as um, a panel um, uh, self-help and uh, Sarge Green from the California oh, Water Institute that uh, talked about their uh, specific efforts um, with consolidation and uh, sort of uh, the, the how to um, receive grants. And so it was, I think, a very useful discussion combining both items. And then um, uh, on Friday, um, Chair Marcus, um, um, Executive Director Sobeck and uh, Michael Lothler, uh, we went to, um, we went on a tour in outside of Yuba City at Montana Farms. And um, I got a lot out of it, even though I'd been there before, yeah, because it was too. exciting to see sort of the connection having been at River Gardens and looking at the opportunity to um, uh, produce fish food on rice fields. And of course, over at River Gardens, there wasn't connectivity to the river, but in this 
um, specific area, one place in particular on Motno Farms, uh, uh, showing connectivity uh, to the river uh, through the Sutter Bypass. And so um, it was exciting to be able to connect the dots with um, some of the projects that we've been seeing out there. And a really good um, discussion um, regarding uh, just sort of big picture, phase two um, voluntary agreements. And I saw an otter. <laughs> yeah, River Otter was really cool. No, it's just there's so much um, land that's been set aside as refuge for birds and all sorts of critters. I mean, there were bigger deer and a zillion swans and shorebirds, and it was really um, a 3D example of what you can do if you put in the time to help the land sort of work with what nature brings. I mean, there was just sort of uh, it was it was um, inspiring. It was great. I was able to finally fulfill my liaison duties and attended the uh, board meetings that the Central Valley Regional Board held as well as the San Francisco Bay Regional Board and Ms. Sobeck was also there for the uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board meeting. Um, I will say of note at the Central Valley Regional Water Board meeting, they had been working on a climate change work plan, very detailed, um, very well done. Uh, they took what we did in our resolution, but also looked th through all of their various programs and described how climate change might impact some of the issues that they're looking mm -hmm. at and just lay the framework, I mean, really just laying down the framework on how they might address that in all their programs moving forward. Very detailed. Um, I'm happy to forward a copy, but I think it's definitely worth reading and perhaps worth considering in terms of our own programs and how it fits in. Um, at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, I'm gonna put Ms. Sobeck on the hot seat because I had to leave before they got to their permit for the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Project. Um, if the chairwoman would remember, this is a project that uh, had some aspects of multi-benefits that were of concern to the Santa Clara Valley Water District. And I don't know how the discussion goes, so I was hoping, oh. Ms. Wobeck, that I, I don't know if you stayed enough uh, for them to get to it. I believe they got to it after lunch. Um, I sat through a number of the presentations, or I sat through all the presentations. I wasn't there for all of the board discussion, but the board did, um, the regional board did end up adopting the permit at their meeting. And there was a lot of discussion about what? these really um, massive, long term, multi segmented, multi benefited projects and the um, problems of lining up and timing of all the different permitting processes. And, and the board did affirmatively recognize that it was um, providing a bit of an open ended permit for aspects of the project that still um, haven't been totally filled in, but that that the certainty that there was going to be a permit out into the future is sort of necessary for getting some of the other pieces put together. So there was a little bit of a leap of faith involved, but but all of the um, proponents, you know, federal, state agencies, NGOs, were all kind of lined up in support of the proposition. So it was it was interesting to sit through. It was, it was, and, and I'll follow up with Mr. Uh, Wolf for additional detail, and I won't get into a lot of specifics because Mr. Wiles there looking at me. I don't know if this will be petitioned to us or not, uh, but there, there was an issue regarding how the regional board staff was proposing to, um, uh, I guess, apply the mitigation aspect of this project. There was some concern that what was being proposed was a tremendous mitigation factor um, way above what staff is proposing in the dredge and field policy that will be coming before us and what, what that precedent might set for future efforts and the mitigation associated with these multi-benefit projects. So I'll leave it at that, but it, it was very interesting. I'm sorry I couldn't stay to the end, but it was one of those things that was flagged um, for my attention as well as, as yours, I believe, um, yeah. earlier this year. Need to dive into that. I appreciate it. Last week, um, I was in Las Vegas for a couple of days for the uh, Council of State Governments uh, yearly conference. Um, there was a water policy component to, and so it's um, state legislators throughout the uh, country come and 
learn about various topics that are happening, share best practices and such. Uh, it reminded me somewhat of uh, National Governors Association's water policy learning network that uh, we're also involved in. But um, so it was a great uh, panel that I participated in. Uh, Radhika Fox from uh, UC Wa or US Water Alliance rather uh, moderated it and uh, Jeff Keitlinger from Metropolitan Water District participated as, in, as did Catherine Sorensen from uh, the director oh, of great. Phoenix Water. She was fantastic. I mean, so is Jeff, but I mean, she's yeah. really, I like her a lot. She, I never it, get to and see her. It was, she was fantastic and, and so was uh, then the representative from Southern uh, Nevada Water um, uh, agency. So it was um, it was it was a great uh, discussion, and you know our our panel particularly was focused on drought. Um, you know it was at first sort of framed in sort of the past tense drought policies, and given our our sluggish winter so far, it felt a little you know, I'd want to jinx things by talking too much about drought at a panel. But anyway, it was it was um, you know the it was encouraging the amount of interest. I mean we our panel started at. 3.30, 4 o'clock of what was a long day already. And um, there were a lot of folks still there in the room, really engaged, wanting to uh, better understand how we addressed drought. And um, and really, you know, my message was it's you're, it's limited what you can do in the middle of the drought. Um, and it's really in those, those off years and it's policies outside of those drought years that build the resiliency that you need. But uh, again, it was a good opportunity. It's always good to be able to, to work with, discuss and collaborate with other states and uh, other representatives from those states to find those commonalities around water policy that I think are really important. So, Cool. I'm really glad you were able to go. That's terrific. Um, just two other things. One, a thought and one a request. Um, uh, I know we have a lot on our agenda next year, but I've been talking with Radhika Fox um, from the One Water Alliance. and. Um, I came up with the idea, and she thought it'd be a good one, of uh, being able to do a workshop at the board where we highlight multi-benefit successes. Because we have so many of them in California. I mean, there are ones in other parts of the country. And so um, just you know, stay tuned and let me know who can help put it together. But I wanted to flag it. Yeah, I'm getting nods. Um, you know, Sort of give me your sense of some of the greatest hits so that we can it, it becomes important because we can showcase it within California. We do spend a fair amount of time on the fights here and on our um, daily what we do, but there are so many things going on where folks on the ground are doing these win-win-wins in both the urban and the rural um, context. So if you could think about some of your sort of greatest hits, it could be a nice way to spend part of one of our workshop days. And then uh, the video of it can be used all over the country, et cetera. So, yeah, so um, a request for that. The other one's sort of a request, too, which is that um, an announcement, which is um, Thursday at 4 o'clock at UC Hastings is a memorial um, gathering for uh, Judge John Racanelli, or Justice John Racanelli, who obviously. Um, very important decisions, specifically with respect to the state water board and our water quality control planning process, in addition to myriad um, other things. And I've been asked to speak just for a few minutes on behalf of the board. And I just want to invite people that there's you got two lines or a vignette or anything in terms of what it's meant to you, to us, but to you even personally, uh, go ahead and wing them my way and I'll do my best to work in as much of it as I can. Okay. Um, with that, let's go on to item number six, the executive director's report. Um, I've, it's the year, it's, it's the year end. I, I, I've, I've sort of mixed, uh, mixed up the order of things a little bit and tried to do some editing and Keep us on up. our toes. And uh, tried to shorten some entries and um, make sure that, um, so that the background isn't lost if you need it or want it, that there are links, a link, but not too many links, so, um, and and cleaned up some of the um, the tables. So if you have thoughts, if you don't like it, if you want to go back to the old order, I'm totally fine with that, or if there's stuff that's missing, um, but uh, just tried to give it a fresh look now that I have some idea of what, what it is that um, we do. No, thank um, you. It was easier to go through. I didn't catch on, I didn't catch why that might be, so. Thanks. Um, one thing I did catch in going through it that would be nice, and this is is more to my colleagues, is 
the workshop on the recycled water policy. I know a variety of board members, Tam, for sure. I think everyone has gone to a lot of the workshops and all that. I, I'm, I'm thinking I know we'll be having our board priorities discussion that we haven't had in a while. Yeah, we, it'll, we're, we'll be getting it on the calendar as well as some of our um, personnel uh, conversations. But um, uh, I, I'd like everyone to think a little bit about uh, Franz Spivey Weber's portfolio and just folks, to what extent folks want to pick up some of her issues. Not, as, you know, again, we don't take lead and own it like <coughs> some of the other boards, but just so that we know somebody's sort of spending a little more time with staff than maybe the rest of us. So I was thinking if I can go to one of those workshops, I will. But I'm also, I'm just leery with water fix on how much we can do, but I don't want to load all of it on Steve and Joaquin. So I did, again, sort of errant thoughts about stuff to make sure that we have at least one of us going in a little more depth. I mean, normally, if I didn't have water fix, I'd do it because it's I've done it for so many years. But we might just have to share all these things is what we'll do and opportunistically, but I just want to be able to think about it. Yeah, just keeping better track of what workshops are coming up and yeah. and et cetera, I think can be, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get them all on your calendar yeah. unless you seize the moment when the thing first comes across. So. And even if they're added to, you know, I'll, I'll work with Amy, but yeah. I'm fine with seeing a bunch of things that are FYIs mm -hmm. and then being able to then making sure that, you know, I can work them in, I do. So. Yeah. I mean, so it was helpful for you. Another that. suggestion might be to the extent that we are not using the Wednesday that are being held for board workshops. Staff might think about using those Wednesdays for things that then, at least we know that it's on our calendar, uh, the time is held on our calendar that we might be able to attend. Yeah. Oh, that's right, so have it there as a... So like tomorrow, for example, is held on all of our calendar as a board workshop day, but we don't have a board workshop. So in the future, any of those, it's kind of hard to project, I guess, but to the extent that you can use those days, at least we'll be able to attend. Oh, then that would allow us yes. two weeks out to know that we're not gonna, oh. Well, and, and I, I suspect that um, staff has an idea of what they're wanting to put on the calendar for workshops, but um, that doesn't necessarily filter over to us. And so it'd be just for planning purposes to have um, a calendar that includes a workshop tentatively being held for subject X versus something that, you know, date where it appears to be open. Yeah, I so, think using those Wednesdays is going to be good since it's the, it'll be the only day the three of us have for months to do anything elective. We may need it for briefings is the problem, though, so. So I, I don't want to throw cold water on it, but, um, the recycled water. Yeah, cold recycled water. The we will do endeavor to do have staff workshops take vacant workshop days, but the workshop days are specifically designed for board workshops, right. and um, and if we snag them all for staff workshops, that might leave us in a um, difficult. Because you position. guys can't be in two places, so you have to think about which workshops would. Well, no, I just we would be. We have lots more staff workshops than we have board workshops, right, right, and right, right. Um, we don't want to take all those days for board workshops potential. But what we'll do is we'll work with Janine and, we'll, um, and try and maximize the use of those for staff workshops when they're not being used for board workshops. You can, to the extent feasible. Yeah. All right. I just want to jump in and say I like the format and uh, the brevity and also that it appears there appears to be a greater effort of having um, uh, uh, things be current. Yeah, I, I did ask staff to give everything a once over in a, a new scrub and, and, I, and they did a great job. So I think it's appreciated. It's, it's just hard to keep that up on a rolling basis. Yeah. Um, so um, but we'll give it a try. Well, with that, I believe I can adjourn this meeting and wish everybody a happy holiday break, whichever holidays you may or may not celebrate, even if it's just time off. So we bid adieu to 2017. 2018. <laughs>